I've recently returned home from speaking at a series of conferences in Australia. Yao is one of my favourite conferences, in part because it's really several conferences and so you get to see nearly all of the talks and you get to hang out with the speakers and learn from them. One of the speakers at this year's conference was Dave Thomas. Dave's one of the authors of the Pragmatic Programmer book, which I recommended in an earlier video. In this presentation, he said something that really resonated with me. We've spent decades trying to write perfect software, and that's an entirely dumb undertaking, since there's no such thing as perfect in software. So, if there's no perfect, why is that, and what should we do instead? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. We're very fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis, Transfic, and Launch Darkly. All of these companies offer products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, Click on the links in the description below and check them out. Software development is about finding sensible, pragmatic engineering solutions to problems, rather than striving for some unobtainable ideal. This is what real engineering looks like, and software engineering in particular. If you would like to learn more about these ideas, check out my best-selling book, Modern Software Engineering, for a detailed exploration of how and why taking an engineering approach to software development improves your chances of success. There's a link to that in the description below too. In his conference talk, Dave Thomas pointed out several different ways that striving for perfection is an inappropriate goal for software. One of his more philosophical arguments was that since change is constant and inevitable, including types of change that are completely outside of our control, then perfection in software can at best only be momentary, because as soon as you achieve it, the conditions will change, and the software will no longer be perfect for the new conditions. He pointed out that if something is perfect, we can't change it, because any change must by definition, make it less than perfect. And the need to change it means that it wasn't perfect in the first place. So perfection is both unobtainable and, by definition, static. Now, I really liked Dave's talk. I'm not entirely sure about the philosophy of perfection, but I strongly agree that perfection is not only unobtainable, but also the wrong target for us to aim for. I think that this is closely related to another mistake that I think is very common in discussions on software. That is equating software with mathematics. I think that this may be where the idea of perfect software comes from. If something is mathematically correct, then I think that most people would say that it is the best possible, close to perfect, if not perfect answer. But I don't think that engineering in any form, let alone software engineering, is really like that. Maths can be extremely important in any form of engineering, but it doesn't define it. Engineering is a lot more pragmatic than that. Engineering is really about the stuff that works practically. Clearly maths works, but for systems that interact with the real world, things quickly reach the point where mathematical models are impractical to establish, except in narrowly defined contexts. We may certainly use 3D trigonometry to draw the characters in a game, and maybe matrix multiplication to rotate and translate them inside a 3D space, but there's more to a game than just that. Playability, or even how a figure moves or how a scene looks, are not defined by mathematical functions alone. Whether the character looks realistic or funny or cool as it moves may be implemented by maths, but also shaped by less than mathematical human creative judgment. This is the same for other forms of engineering too. Aesthetics and judgment calls often play a part. If I design a new aeroplane, 
then these days, of course, I will do it with the aid of computers and simulate the fit of its parts and even its flight characteristics. And these models these days will be very good, but they aren't ever perfect. Test pilots will still go and fly the new aeroplane through a rigorous program of test flights and they will learn new things that the simulations didn't catch. If we design a new car, we'll create rough sketches and later detailed computer models. But we'll also create a life-size clay model so that we can understand the sense of the thing. Modern engineering is a scientifically informed discipline that relies heavily on maths, but it isn't the same thing as maths. And this isn't just about how the UI looks, it's also about the functional fit of our solutions with the problem space that they inhabit. Our choices are not driven by pure logic, they're moderated and leavened by human experience and design. This has an impact on how we write our code, as well as how we design our systems. Code is written to be read by humans. Sure, it has to tell the computer what to do too, but if it only does that, it's probably very poor code. If it executes, it may be mathematically correct, but that's not enough. It also needs to be understandable, navigable and maintainable by people to have real utility. I think that Dave Thomas hit on an important idea in his talk. I think that many of us have thought that our job is to write software that is in some way perfect, that is mathematically correct in some way. But I'd argue that this is neither sufficient nor practically achievable, both at the same time. Taking a pragmatic engineering approach is much more important. The huge difference here is that for some ideal perfect solution, we'd need to know all of the answers ahead of time to achieve it. And certainly humans, but probably the universe too, doesn't really work like that. It's not that simple. This is why scientific style reasoning, rather than only mathematical style reasoning, is so important. With maths, we aim to make logically consistent, coherent arguments. This is very difficult, however good you are at maths. Famously, in their book Principia Mathematica, Whitehead and Russell spent a thousand pages showing that 1 plus 1 equals 2. They didn't set out expecting it to take that long. Their aim was to make the axioms on which maths was built more rigorous. What they found instead was that this was a lot trickier than it looked. Later, Gödel came along and showed that any self-referential system can't prove itself, including mathematics itself, so even mathematics has feet of clay. I'm not attempting to rubbish maths here, of course. It's the most complete logical framework that we have. But if we are doing practical things, or even impractical things, maths has limitations. There comes a point in most human endeavours where maths gets so difficult that we resort to more pragmatic problem-solving techniques instead. Science is one of those, engineering is another. This may sound like a contentious idea, but maths is primarily a modelling tool, not the truth of the world. In the 1960s, Peter Higgs predicted the existence of a particle, that if it existed, completed the standard model in particle physics. This was a big deal. He did this based on some nice maths that seemed elegant and also fitted the facts. But he didn't win his Nobel Prize until people built the Large Hadron Collider and demonstrated the existence of the Higgs boson. The machines that proved the existence of the Higgs boson certainly used maths, sure, but maths alone wasn't enough. We need to measure reality first to test the predictions that the maths makes. In science, even in the most mathematical of sciences, physics, maths alone isn't enough to prove something. You still have to seek more evidence, like reproducible experiments, or verifying or even better falsifying predictions from, from your theories. In engineering, we do similar things. We test fly new aeroplanes and we monitor new software in production to see what really happens. Why does any of this matter if you're a regular software developer? Well, I think that there are a few reasons. First, quite a lot of people have spent quite a lot of their time working on ideas like provable systems. This is, to my mind, a mistake or at least a niche and a misunderstanding of what software is really. Sure, 
for simple constrained systems, perhaps something like a digital signal processor, or maybe even the fundamentals of a messaging system. We can prove it. But I'd argue that this is the same use of maths as my 3D game example earlier. The maths is a great tool in those narrow contexts, but then the real world intervenes and makes the problem so much more complex. In a variety of ways, from the perspective of our, the users of our software and from our perspective as the producers of that software. At these points, we tend to stop using only maths and start using other, less rigorous techniques instead. I've included a link in the description below from a formal methods expert promoting his discipline. He cites several uses of formal methods but they're either narrow in scope, as I've already described, or they really don't really stand up to critical scrutiny. He cites aeroplane design as one example of the use of provable systems. But the recent example of the Boeing 737 MAX demonstrates how much more complex the world of software is than that. In this case, social and commercial pressures and changes in the engineering culture at Boeing all played a part in some very bad choices that resulted in software killing large numbers of people in several aeroplane accidents. Modern complex software exists in a socio-technical context. It is more than only maths and it requires the pragmatism of engineering thinking to limit risks. For narrowly scoped problems, formal methods that result in provable software can be extremely useful tools. But as soon as systems and or the environment in which they operate become more complex than that, the proof rapidly becomes too complex to understand or to apply. The maths to prove the system becomes more complex than the system it's trying to prove. And so the proof is as likely to be as wrong as the solution. It's these interactions with the real world where the deeply pragmatic empiricism of problem solving that is at the heart of all engineering really comes into play. The test pilot in his aeroplane or the car designing clay modeler, test driven development and the monitoring and observability of our production systems are all about empirical learning. TDD is not meant to prove that your software is correct. This is a common misunderstanding and an assumption from people who have not tried it. They assume that what people like me are talking about when I describe TDD is something that proves the correctness of my software. And they point out quite correctly that it can't do that. But it isn't meant to. TDD is about engineering, not about mathematical proof. I think of TDD as a falsification mechanism rather than any form of proof. The more interesting bit is when the test fails rather than when it passes. What we are doing with this form of engineering approach is to find simpler, pragmatic ways in which we can gain more confidence in our software without the doing at least very difficult, probably impossible, work of trying to prove our systems. I recognise that I've been talking fairly philosophically so far. So how can you make use of these ideas more practically? Well, first, as ever, my advice is practice test driven development. It gives us a kind of lightweight version of a formal proof. Certainly not a real proof, but at least more confidence that for the problems that we've thought about, our code does what we meant it to. Then take that other engineering stance and think about how your code should fail safely. Think about how things may go wrong, and then think about what you'd like your system to do when those bad things happen. The canonical story of this is probably the Apollo 11 moon landing. As the lunar lander approached the surface of the moon, the astronauts called out a 1202 alarm, worrying that it meant that they'd have to abort the mission. This was a feature added by Margaret Hamilton and her, her team who were designing the guidance system for the Apollo missions. As they did the engineering thing and worried about the different ways that their system could fail. In this case, exceeding the very limited processing capacity of the Apollo guidance computer. What Hamilton's team did was to reboot the computer and drop tasks that became unnecessary and were overloading it. 
So basically, they turned the computer off and turned it back on again when it was showing signs of stress. They didn't know when this overstress might happen. They weren't even sure that it would happen. But if it did happen, they didn't want their software to kill the astronauts. So although they didn't know how this would play out exactly, they added the failsafe just in case it might help. If the 12.02 alarms had happened more frequently than they did, the restarts would have meant that the critical functions of the guidance computer were compromised. But their pragmatic empirical solution gave the astronauts a better chance of success, even if it didn't guarantee the success of the mission. This is real engineering in action, and it's a lot more practical and pragmatic than maths alone. So don't aim to build perfect systems. Better to assume that your ideas are imperfect and think about how you could find those mistakes as early in the process as you can. Instead of perfect systems, try to engineer usable, safe systems instead. And when you find a mistake, whenever you find the mistake, aim to avoid repeating those mistakes in the future. That's how engineering makes progress, not by assuming that we must build perfect systems. Thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoy my stuff, please consider supporting our work on this channel by joining our Patreon community. Thank you.